Monkeys are miracles in motion. In the open, few move with the skill, the agility, and the energy that these beauties display. But then, these are very special monkeys. And they roam free in a very special place. The National Zoo in Washington, D.C. They're golden lion tamarins. And this is their story. Meet the tamarins who brighten up life at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. This is Eduardo. He's the dad. This is Laranja. She's the mom. And here are their twin daughters, Samba and Gisela. For the next six months, the family will enjoy life without bars, cages, or fences. That's right, they'll roam free. Not a restraint in sight. The whole zoo is the little fur family's home for now. But things change, as we will see. Golden Lion Tamarins get their name because they never have a bad hair day. 500 years ago, explorers from Europe came to southern Brazil. In the Atlantic coastal rainforests, the Tamarins' homeland, they saw marvelous creatures moving through dense greenery. The first thing the visitors thought of when they saw a tamarind's head up close was the king of beasts. But except for being fellow mammals, a mane is mainly all tamarinds and lions have in common. Lions are big, burly plains dwellers. Tamarinds are tiny. Adults weigh about a pound and a half. And they're related to the marmoset, another small, long-tailed monkey. They spend most of their time in trees. At the National Zoo, an extraordinary program lets the monkeys roam as they like. Their warm weather home is wide open, which makes some visitors wonder why they stick around. Jennifer Mickelberg manages the zoo's Golden Lion Tamarind program. Everyone wants to know why don't the Golden Lion Tamarinds leave this area? Why don't they go to Georgetown or visit the president, you know, at the White House? And the reason is this because they're very territorial. They have a nest box which is hanging in the tree. They have their food here. So really the two major things they need, and the third is company. They have each other, so they don't have any reason to go too far away. Now, do they like to explore new areas? Yeah, but they're not gonna go too far because they wanna get back home at night. Here, the tamarinds are newcomers. They have to deal with urban neighbors. It's a good way for the twins to practice guarding territory. Tamarins patrol to look for food and to keep watch for friends and enemies. But nothing can take them more than a few hundred yards from their nests. The National Zoo occupies about 170 acres. The free-range tamarins patrol about 20 acres of that. Fair elbow room for a family of four, but not as much as they'd have in the wild. A family like Ed Eduardo's here would need about 100 acres or so. That's the average uh, home range size for gold mine tamarinds. Now, if you have a very good area where there's a lot of fruit and a lot of insects, your territory can be smaller. But if it's not a very desirable area, your territory has to be big so you can find food. That's why here we maintain around about 20 acres or so. They could go further, but they don't need to. They have everything they need right here and sometimes things they didn't know they wanted. Like a mop head full of mealworms. The zoo doesn't expect its free range tamarinds to live solely off the land. They have to do their part. We always are looking for interesting ways to present their food rather than just handing it to them or putting it on a tray where it's very easy to find because in the wild, they have to work to find insects. 
this is a, a great thing for them because they love to pick around and look for their food. So the tamarins really love this, this mop head because it gives them an opportunity to dig around and find the mealworms. At the National Zoo, as in the wild, tamarins literally hang out. Their main turf is called Beaver Valley, after its other inhabitants. In warm weather, late May to October, these tamarins have the run of the place. But the tamarins here can live as they do in the forest, usually staying between 5 and 25 feet up, hardly ever touching the ground. In the wild, this is where the monkeys find their food and how they avoid predators. In Brazil, hawks and other raptors prey on tamarins. This keeps the monkeys from the uppermost branches. Other natural enemies include snakes and cats, like the ocelot and margay, which keep tamarins up off the ground. The National Zoo's free-ranging tamarins have a house up high. Wild tamarins live in hollow trees. Here, home is prefab, but it's a cool pad. In fact, it's a cooler pad, made from a piece of gear you probably have at your house. So these guys sleep in what's really a modified picnic cooler. And we do that because it's, it's easy to clean, it, we know it protects them from cold weather, and it's relatively uh, rain-proof and also weatherproof. The Beaver Valley Tamarins come to this area to feed, socialize, and sleep. They typically return to this nest box every single night, although occasionally we've had pairs that have found tree holes, which is where they naturally would sleep, in other parts of the zoo, which for me is very exciting because it means that they're, they're finding things that they would in the wild. The tamarins may come to the nest box in bad weather or if they feel frightened. Inside, there's another opening. The second room is warmer because it's smaller. A cozy hideaway in case the monkeys are upset, perhaps by local predators like hawks, owls, or raccoons, or other zoo residents' calls. There's a hole in the back of this nest box in the back of this, back of this partition here, and they'll all go down here, no matter if it's two or four or six or sometimes eight tamarins. And this particular design with the partition is very important because it allows for protection against a predator. If something got in there, they have a hard time defending this whole area. Um, so we've divided it so they can go down to the lower area and stay pretty safe. The National Zoo's tamarins are pretty safe, but in the wild, the species is endangered. In fact, during the 20th century, golden lion tamarins almost went extinct. It happened for several reasons. When explorers reached Brazil, the coastal forests ran thousands of miles. A seamless monkey wonderland. Tamarins had plenty of food in France. Then, Brazil's population began to grow. People thought it might be nice to have a tamarin around the house. But like many wild animals, tamarins can't be housebroken, and they make a funky mess. Up until the 60s and even some in the early 70s, it was a pretty big problem where people were taking them in. They're small, they're cute, they're charismatic, they're bright gold, and people thought they would make great pets, which they don't. And tamarins had problems far worse than being kidnapped. People began to carve up the wilderness. They felled trees for lumber. They burned the forest to farm and raise domestic animals. The great green blanket became a tattered patchwork. The other major reason for the decline of gold nine tamarins is habitat loss. And this is true for critters all over the world. In the area where the gold nine tamarins are from, it's right outside of Rio de Janeiro, about an hour and a half drive or so. There's less than 2% of their habitat remaining. 
deprived of habitat, cut off from one another. Tamarins couldn't mate. Their numbers dwindled. In the 1960s, only a few hundred golden lion tamarins existed in the wild. Things looked bad for the species. Somebody had to do something. Somebody did. Brazil began to pass laws protecting not only the golden lion tamarind, but many other species and their environments. The golden lion tamarinds, they may be a small monkey, but they are pretty important to the ecosystem in Brazil. And they actually serve as what we call a flagship species for the Atlantic coastal rainforest. So if we can protect enough habitat for the golden lion tamarinds, we're also protecting habitat for other critters as well. And they do have an important role in an ecosystem. They eat fruit, and what comes out the other end are seeds, and so they are important for seed dispersal. Brazilians are incredibly supportive of this effort, and they really love their gold mine tamarins and, and work hard to protect them as well. Definitely a joint international effort. The tamarin, which people had almost loved to death, became a national icon. It even shows up on Brazilian currency. Gold mine tamarin is on their 20 PI note, which is worth about five or six dollars. So every Brazilian's probably carrying one around. But they really do adore these animals and they all take it very seriously that it's their job to protect them because they're only found in this one specific area in Brazil and they're only found in Brazil. To help, scientists at the National Zoo worked with other zoos to breed golden lion tamarinds. Then see if some of those animals could return to the Brazilian forest to rebuild the wild population. One of the things that makes this program unique is that all gold lion tamarins, even the ones here, Eduardo and his family, they're all owned by Brazil. To help ensure the survival of the species, Brazil lends its favorite monkeys to zoos all over the world. Since the 1980s, more than 150 zoos, including 62 in the U.S., have joined the effort. Zoos keep detailed records of which animals breed so that the species genes stay strong. The National Zoo is Tamarin Matchmaking Central. Every tamarin has its pedigree, its family tree, all sorts of information entered into a database. And then what we can do is decide who's gonna breed with whom based on their genetic compatibility, if you will. The Brazilian forest is now home to more than 500 golden lion tamarins, thanks to reintroductions by captive breeding programs. The National Zoo was the first American zoo to free-range tamarins, starting in 1986. Samba, Gisela, and their parents have been living free since June 2006. That was when zoo grounds became tamarind territory. The monkeys can wander all they like, but they're always within reach. The way we follow the tamarins in Brazil and also the ones here at National Zoo is through the use of radio telemetry. And the adults are fitted with a radio transmitter, which is a small collar that just fits around their neck. And it gives off a signal every one second that we can pick up with a large antenna and a receiver. The wireless units give wearers locations at all times. Basically, the louder the beep, um, the, that indicates the direction of the tamarins. So as I move it around, if I point in this general direction, that's where it's loudest, so we know Eduardo's in that general area someplace. Eduardo's wire is over his right shoulder. Laranja's is on her left shoulder. The twins aren't big enough, so they go bareback. This helps human observers tell one tamarind from another. So do touches of dye. When we're trying to do our behavior observations, it's really important that we can tell them all apart. 
and um, the best way to do that is by dyeing their tails. Sometimes when you're looking up in the tree, you may just see a little glimpse of their tail and um, nothing of their face, so it's important that we can tell them apart by their tails. Laranja's tail is simply black. Eduardo's is half and half. Gisela is keeping it real. Besides monitoring the tamarins over the air, the National Zoo recruits volunteers to study the monkey's behavior. Tamarins are active during the day. So from dawn to dusk, human onlookers observe and record their activities. Typically in the morning, they come out of the box around seven, cross over the trail using an arboreal pathway, and they'll move into this area uh, to forage, I like to forage over there by the abandoned garden. Unlike most species, tamarins are mostly monogamous. Mothers almost always bear twins, and raising babies is a family affair, with males carrying the little ones. Like all twins, Gisela and Samba are individuals with distinct personalities. Samba's always been the more outgoing of the two twins, and right away from the beginning, she was the first one to move on her own. She didn't need to be carried. Usually, Gisela was being carried. And she's just always been kind of more outgoing, more, a little bit more adventurous. Gisela's been an interesting monkey to watch adapt outside. When she first came out, she was very timid. We used to call her Princess G because she always wanted dad's attention. She was definitely a daddy's girl. The more time she's been outside, the more independent she's become. She's starting to lead the family to different places in the park and um, really taking a different role. Being a twin means always having someone to play with. The Tamarind twins do enjoy themselves. But for them, life isn't all fun and games. They're always in school. The little monkeys are born knowing many things, like the basics of climbing. Tamarins have four agile fingers and a thumb, just as we do, and active tails help them stay on course. They use their tail for balance. It's not prehensile. They use it strictly for balance, and you'll see it going back and forth as they move across and locomote across the rope. But to glide through the trees with the greatest of ease, you have to practice. 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 In captivity, they're often in exhibits that are, everything's stabilized, everything's tied down, branches don't move, branches certainly don't break. And um, out here, everything moves, nothing is, is stationary really except these big trunks of the trees and the fence. So th these guys really have to learn, how hard do I have to push, even though this branch is moving, to get over there? And there's more to being a monkey than monkeying around. Good hygiene, for instance. Tamarins groom one another to strengthen family bonds. Plus, they catch lice and other insects that are finger licking good. A snack, yes, but also a way to keep one another healthy. In the wild, the monkeys drink from puddles that collect in plants. Here, water comes in cups. Their diet might sound a little like yours. Bananas, apples, oranges, crickets, mealworms. Worm. What? You don't eat live insects? Delicious. Great, that means more for the tamarind. The twins love the worms. <laughs> they learned very quickly from mom and dad that this was a great treat. <laughs> Tamarins aren't above stealing one another's lunches. That was a, a food steal. They're happy to share. Eduardo is picking it out of the tube 
and this baby's taking it right from his hands. And he doesn't get mad. Another part of the learning process. Tamarind snack between meals. It's true. But they also have an official menu. This is a canned diet that all of our um, tamarinds and marmosets get. It has all the nutrients they need except for some um, vitamin C, so we supplement it with fruit. And it tastes a little bit like um, oatmeal with no sugar. I'm sure you guys don't want to try some of this? Mm -mm. This is by far their favorite. It's true, monkeys love bananas. These guys are no exception. Okay, grapes, apples, bananas, papaya. How about, we'll just do a little bit of melon and that should be good. And then egg today, because it's Friday. So get some protein. The monkeys use their skinny hands to micro-manipulate, working for their meals. Food's tastier if it presents a challenge. After a big feed, the family goes for a stroll. The twins roam with mom and dad, learning to patrol. Adult tamarinds mark territory by rubbing their bodies on trees. You'll see them, they'll scent mark their territory, just like they would in the wild, and they just kind of rub along a branch and leave a very musky odor behind. And that's to um, let other tamarinds know as well that this is their turf. In the wild, tamarinds call out to warn one another of their presence. If they vocalize and hear another tamarind call, they're going to go running to defend their territory. And I think it's kind of interesting because these guys, when they defend, they're not very aggressive physically, but they certainly do a lot of talking. Zoos used to use places like Beaver Valley as a sort of training ground for tamarinds heading back to Brazil. Groups would spend a season hanging out before flying down to Rio and hitting the forest. It turned out the monkeys didn't need much practice monkeying around before being released. But once they were released in Brazil, tamarinds benefited from human assistance. And if their nest boxes went along, they did even better. They go to Brazil with their cooler. Um, we give them food, we give them some water, we give them medical attention if they need it. If they get lost, we bring them back. Um, if they decide they don't like their nest box, we give them a new one. This really intensive post-release monitoring seems to confer an advantage on them in terms of their survival. If we can get these, these captive animals to live long enough in Brazil to have babies that are born in Brazil, they act like true Brazilians. They, they do a lot of things that tamarinds that have never seen a captive environment do. The golden lion tamarind survival is far from guaranteed. But things are a little better than they were. We've reintroduced 153 gold lion tamarinds since 1984. And from those 153, they're, we're on, I think, the fifth or sixth generation now, and there have been there are somewhere between 550 and 750 gold line tamarinds in the wild, just from those 153. So they've bred, and their kids have bred, and, and the population is doing quite well in Brazil because of that reintroduction component. So that's over a third of the entire population, the reintroduced animals and their descendants. Brazil is a year-round monkey paradise. But in North American zoos, tamarinds have to spend the cold weather months inside with their caged cousins. This is the exhibit where um, Eduardo and the family are gonna come back to after they're, they're finished free-ranging. And right now, Eduardo's brother, Marty, and his mate, Sienna, are in there. And they'll move to a different enclosure. But this is actually where they were before they came outside, so they, they'll be pretty comfortable in here for a few months until they come back outside next, next season. 
The accommodations at the small mammal house are warm and inviting, and the monkeys have plenty of admiring company. Oh, look at him jump! Oh, oh, he ran right across the wall. Wall. But being outside is really where it's at. Zoos are constantly striving to make exhibits more wildlike, like you'd find in their natural habitat. And I think in terms of what we can do here in Washington, D.C., this is probably as good as it gets for a golden lion tamarind, being able to freely roam around the trees. And I think we're successful in doing that. So if you're in the nation's capital, stop by the National Zoo. Winter or summer, the golden lion tamarind's always welcome a visit.